today is Sunday, June 3rd, 2018, and we are live, and uh, we should be live here on uh, YouTube in just a minute also. All right, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, wasn't on, uh, we were not on last weekend. Uh, it was a Memorial Day weekend. That's right, we were not on last weekend for Memorial Day weekend. So uh, there's a lot going on and uh, a lot to talk about, all right? So uh, we know this past week uh, we saw the cancellation of the uh, TV show Roseanne. Okay, the cancellation of the TV show Roseanne. Uh, Roseanne Barr, the star of the show, made some idiotic uh, comments on Twitter. And then there was a whole backlash from this as well. Uh, we know uh, ABC uh, canceled her show. And then she came up with all these excuses of why uh, she made these tweets and she tried to blame it on Ambien. She tried to blame it on everything except the rain. Okay, you remember? <laughs> you remember Millie Vanilli blaming on the rain? She tried to blame it on everything except the rain. So we're going to talk some about that. Roseanne Barr's show, uh, Roseanne gets canceled by a black woman because of a bigoted tweet about a black woman. Very, very interesting. Okay, and this uh, uh, also deals with Channing Dungy, who's the president of uh, ABC uh, Entertainment. Okay, so We'll talk about that. And I did a Facebook Live broadcast. Uh, well, I did a video and put it on Facebook. It's having technical difficulties. Uh, we dealt with that uh, earlier in the week. Okay, so check that out at the African History Network, the African History Network uh, on Facebook. Okay. And then uh, I also want to deal with Starbucks. So Starbucks is back in the news. We know this past Tuesday, actually the same day that the, um, the same day that uh, Roseanne's show got canceled was uh, Tuesday, May 29th, and this was the day that uh, Starbucks held their implicit bias training, their imp implicit bias training, okay? And they closed over 8,000 uh, Starbucks stores to uh, hold this training, okay? And uh, the training has yielded uh, mixed results, okay? There's an article from Philly.com, Philadelphia Inquirer, about it, Starbucks closes stores for anti-racial bias training recap. And then news1.com has a, a story, a couple of stories about this. Here's what Starbucks workers learned at the company-wide day of anti-bias training. So the uh, training, uh, the results have been mixed, or actually the training itself, just the training that was given, uh, has um, uh, mixed reviews from uh, employees, okay? But what people have to understand is Starbucks said this from the beginning. They said that they don't think one day of training is going to cure racism or cure implicit bias or anything like this. And they said this is basically the first step in a process. All right. So this is the first step in a process. So this is something people have to keep in mind. But we'll talk some about that. Uh, and then uh, so we'll deal with that in, in the first hour. Then in the second hour, uh, I want to. Um, go back to a topic we dealt with briefly the last time we were on the air, I think it was, and we talked about um, uh, Malcolm X and the uh, Malcolm, his 93rd birthday of Malcolm X. Well, at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, uh, they had A. Peter Bailey there, and A. Peter Bailey is a journalist. He was a friend of Malcolm. He was a member of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, but he was also a writer for the newspaper for the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History on Saturday, uh, March 19th, 2018, um, he did a comparison between uh, Malcolm X and Dr. King toward the end of both of their lives. Okay, He did a comparative analysis uh, looking at statements that they made on different topics, whether you're talking about economic empowerment, education, uh, voting rights, things like this, okay? So uh, in, in the second hour, we're going to deal with uh, Dr. King and Malcolm X had a lot in common, had a lot more in common than people think. Dr. King and Malcolm X had a lot more in common than people think. And I hear people calling the radio shows, talking about Dr. King, talking about Malcolm X, and I can tell most of them haven't studied either one of them. Because if they actually had studied both of them, one, they would know that Dr. King did not hate Malcolm. Malcolm did not hate Dr. King. Two, they would know that Malcolm thought that the Nation of Islam should get involved in the Civil Rights Movement. And July, 30, July 31st, 1963, 
uh, when Malcolm was still in the Nation of Islam, Malcolm sends a letter to the eight civil rights uh, leaders and organizations calling for a meeting. And he says that uh, if uh, 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 John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev can put aside their major differences, and if they can meet, he said that African-American leaders, Negro leaders, should be able to uh, meet, put aside their minor differences, and he said that they needed to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. Okay, now this is Malcolm before he leads the nation to Islam. But most people who talk about Malcolm don't talk about this. They don't talk about how Malcolm got involved in the civil rights movement when he left the nation of Islam. Yeah, he organized the Organization of Afro-American Unity, but Malcolm helped radicalize the civil rights movement, and he focused on human rights, taking that fight internationally, human rights, okay? So both Malcolm and Dr. King are, are grossly misunderstood. And if you listen to Reverend Al Sharpton's show and you listen to some of the callers that call in to his show, and we know uh, Reverend Al is uh, here on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation, every um, uh, Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you listen to some of the people call in and, 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 and talk negatively about Dr. King. You can tell they never read any of Dr. King's books. Okay, they never any never read any of his actual speeches. They have a, a total misunderstanding of Dr. King. So May 8th, 1967, the month after Dr. King comes out against the nation, uh, I'm sorry, the month after Dr. King comes out uh, against the Vietnam War, okay, uh, he did an interview with um, NBC News. He did an interview with NBC News, okay? And a lot of people have, uh, have not heard this interview. And Dr. King talks about uh, after civil rights, and he talks about the Black Power Movement. OK, now this is a year before he's assassinated. This is May 5th, 1967. OK, so the previous month, April 4th, 1967, Dr. King comes out in opposition publicly against the Vietnam War, against the um, against the advice of the uh, uh, leading civil rights leaders at the time. And overnight, he becomes uh, the most hated man in America. OK. He gets banned from the White House. You have civil rights leaders uh, telling him that he should not speak out against the Vietnam War because um, this is going against President Lyndon Johnson. President Johnson is a friend of, of the civil rights movement. He's a friend of the civil rights leaders. But Dr. King was operating uh, based upon a moral basis, not based upon trying to find friends, not based upon what was popular. He was operating from a moral basis, okay? So we're going to deal with this uh, uh, in the second hour. And uh, Dr. King was, uh, he talks about uh, the civil rights movement and human rights after the Civil Rights Act of 64, after the Voting Rights Act of 65. What's next? He talks about the black power movement, and he talks about the difficulty of getting these uh, issues addressed because of the Vietnam War that's taking place as well, okay? So this is a little-known interview that has been recently been restored by um, uh, NBC News, okay? So very, very, uh, very, very important. All right, so on the African, and then also we'll deal with this date in African-American history. So on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here. On the show, we deal with current events and history and Politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter um, as well. Or go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Sign up for the email newsletter there as well. Okay, those on Facebook, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also, okay? Those watching us on Facebook, the African History Network, and on uh, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation um, on Facebook. Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in as well. 
Okay, so um, when we look at what happened with Roseanne Barr, okay, this past Tuesday, and it's interesting that the same day that this took place and the show got canceled, and the show canceled by an African American woman, um, that's the day that NB, that's the day that uh, MSNBC had their uh, special Everyday Racism in America. Everyday Racism in America. Okay. And I did a uh, Facebook Live broadcast today uh, dealing with uh, everyday racism in America, dealing with the um, uh, the special that was on MSNBC. And, dealing, and I dealt with three problems uh, with the special, okay? So check that out also, and we dealt with a lot of history. Uh, that's uh, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I'm sorry, that's at The African History Network on Facebook, The African History Network, and it's on um a YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube, okay? So if we look at uh, the article from the Washington Post, the Washington Post had a really good article dealing with this. Um, ABC cancels Roseanne after its star Roseanne Barr went on a vitriolic and racist Twitter rant. ABC cancels Roseanne after its star goes on a uh, went on a vitriolic and racist Twitter rant. And we're coming up on a break. So we're going to jump into this on the other side of the break. We're coming up on a two-minute break. So don't go anywhere. Those on Facebook, those on YouTube, don't go anywhere. Hey, you listen to the African History Network show, 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the future radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the future radio. Hey, I'm your host, brother, Michael M. Hotel, And uh, we're on, uh, we should be on YouTube here. All right, we're on YouTube also. Uh, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube as well. So hopefully we're coming in um, well on YouTube as well. All right. So right before the break, uh, we were getting into our discussion dealing with um, Roseanne Barr's show, Roseanne being canceled um, this past Tuesday, same day as um, MSNBC had their um, special dealing with everyday racism, everyday racism uh, on uh, in, uh, everyday racism in America on MSNBC, okay? And uh, I did a Facebook Live broadcast about that, and I talked a little bit about Roseanne. But uh, there were three main problems with uh, the uh, special they had on MSNBC. And it was, uh, it was a good effort. It was some good information. I like Joanne Reed. She co-hosted. I like Chris Hayes. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton was on. I like Reverend Al Sharpton as well. Listen, been listening to his radio show for uh, 14 years. I think he's been on 14 years uh, since the beginning when it was Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, Warren Ballantyne, my frat brother, and um, Reverend Al Sharpton. Okay, but first problem is they never define from a historical perspective what racism is. That's the first problem. They never did. They did a whole hour show talking about everyday racism, implicit bias, things like this. They never define from a historical perspective what racism is. So that's the first problem. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race that comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. And the byproduct of racism is what we call white privilege. Okay, so they did not break that down from a historical perspective. That's the first problem. Second problem is um, they did not um, have a historian on the show to deal with racism from a historical perspective. Okay, and they explain this. That's 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 another problem. Okay, so um, I, I dealt with this on my um, the Facebook live broadcast. So check that out. Okay, all right. And the third problem is they didn't deal with the role the media plays in perpetuating racism and spreading racial stereotypes. Okay, and criminalizing and showing African Americans disproportionately as being criminals on welfare things like this. They didn't deal with the role that the media plays, the white controlled media. Okay, they didn't deal with that at all. All right. So other than that, I guess it was OK. All right. So when we look at this article from um, Washington Post, ABC cancels uh, Roseanne after its star Roseanne Barr went on a vitriolic and racist uh, Twitter rant. And they talk about how uh, Roseanne Barr uh, tweeted on uh, 2.45 a.m. on uh, it was Tuesday morning. She lives out in L.A. Then it was. Uh, late uh, Monday night, um, she tweeted about Valerie Jarrett. Now, Valerie Jarrett is the former senior advisor to uh, Pr President Barack Obama. She's an African-American woman, very intelligent, 
very articulate, very sharp African-American woman. But she tweeted, um, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby equals VJ, referring to Valerie Jarrett. Okay. Now, though she later claimed it was a joke, she issued a fuller apology on Tuesday after more intense criticism was directed toward her uh, and ABC uh, and, and ABC. And she tweeted, I apologize. So later on Tuesday, 1030 a.m. in the morning, Tuesday, May 29th, she tweeted, I apologize to Valerie Jarrett and to all Americans. I'm truly sorry for making a bad joke about her politics and her looks. I should have known better. Forgive me. My joke uh, was in bad taste. Well, first of all, it wasn't funny. OK, probably the only people something like that was funny to are white supremacists and, uh, and a lot of them are Donald Trump supporters. Not saying all Donald Trump supporters but are white supremacists, but most white supremacists are Donald Trump supporters. OK. And uh, the other thing was she tweeted a whole bunch of other crazy things uh, that day as well. All right. Now, this wasn't the first time she um, tweeted some, uh, uh, something negatively about African-Americans because a few years ago she tweeted something very negatively uh, um, there was something very negative about uh, Susan Rice, who was the uh, national, Sec national security advisor to Donald Trump, African-American woman as well. Now, Channing Dungy, Channing Dungy, who uh, is the president of ABC Entertainment, did not consider the tweet a joking manner. OK. And uh, in a statement, Channing, Dun uh, 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 Channing Dungy said, uh, quote, Roseanne's Twitter statement is abhorrent, repugnant and inconsistent with our values. We're abhorrent, repugnant, and inconsistent with our values, and we have decided to cancel her show, okay? And she said this in a statement released just hours after Roseanne's offensive social, social media rant. Now, Roseanne Barr was also dropped by her talent agency on that, on that day as well, ICM Partners, who announced in a statement that her disgraceful, quote, her disgraceful uh, and unacceptable tweet, end quote, was antithetical to our core values, both as individuals and as an agency. Consequently, we have notified her that we will not represent her, okay? They notified, so she lost two jobs in one day, so to speak, okay? <laughs> Over this tweet. But there were other tweets that she did that day that were crazy as well, all right? So some people, you know, are wondering, some people are saying, you know, Rosanna's been getting... Uh, worse over the years. Uh, we know sometimes as people get older, their brain starts to deteriorate, i.e. Donald Trump, i.e. Rudy Giuliani. Now, um, Valerie Jarrett also appeared on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, MSNBC, Everyday Racism. She was already scheduled to be on the show before this took place. And Valerie Jarrett addressed the comments um, on Everyday Racism, the town hall uh, meeting on MSNBC. And she said that Disney chairman Bob Iger had called her before the announcement that Roseanne's show was going to be canceled because Valerie Jarrett is very well connected. And most people know this. Uh, she said, quote, this should be a teaching moment, end quote. OK. And she said, I'm fine. I'm worried about all the people out there who don't have a circle of friends and followers who come right to their defense. The person who's walking down the street minding their own business and they see somebody cling to their purse or walk across the street or or every black parent I know who has a boy who has to sit down and have a conversation. OK, quote unquote, the talk, as we call it, those ordinary examples of racism that happen every single day. OK, so this this is what she was saying was her uh, main concern. Uh, now, the uh, the news capped the day of online furor over a, a tweet storm that also included false conspiracy theories as well as attacks on former first daughter Chelsea Clinton. OK, so she uh, Roseanne Barr, you know, so she she has been um, uh, tweeting conspiracy theories for years. And you see why she's a Donald Trump supporter, because he deals with conspiracy theories, a bunch of a bunch of nonsense. Right. Um, so she tweeted Chelsea Soros Clinton, Chelsea. This, so this was, uh, May 28th. This was Monday, Memorial day, 1154 PM Chelsea Soros Clinton. All right. And, um, she, um, this was dealing with, she started spreading a rumor. She started spreading the false rumor that Chelsea Clinton is married to the nephew of billionaire liberal democratic donor, George Soros. OK, and George Soros is a lightning rod for false conservative conspiracy theories. Right. So Chelsea Clinton responds 
Uh, good morning, Roseanne. My my given name, my given middle name is Victoria. I imagine George Soros' nephews are lovely people. I'm not. Uh, I'm just not married to one. I'm grateful for the important work uh, at Open Society does in the world. Have a great day. Okay. So Roseanne Barr later corrected in another tweet what she said, and she said, "Correction: Chelsea Clinton is not married to a Soros nephew. Her husband is the son of a corrupt senator. So sorry. All right." And then she goes on to make allegations that George Soros um, sold out Jews to Germans during the Holocaust. And George Soros uh, was uh, uh, basically a survivor of the Holocaust. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of crazy stuff. She said, sorry to have tweeted incorrect info about you. Please forgive me. By the way, George Soros is a Nazi who turned in his fellow Jews to be murdered in German concentration camps and stole their wealth. Were you aware of that? But we all make mistakes, right, Chelsea? This is what Roseanne tweeted. Now, there have been other idiotic tweets, right, that she's done. And before the reboot of her show, before her show came back after 21-year hiatus, she went and deleted tweets. Okay? So this is, this is clearly a disturbed woman. This is, this is clearly a disturbed woman. OK, she also she um, and she uh, went on to tweet on May 29th, 1 32 a.m. OK, as soon as Americans unite against this info, MK ultra classes narrative, the better we will all be. All right. Now, Roseanne Barr has tweeted in the past about pedogate. OK, the term for conspiracy theories that accuse people, usually Trump opponents of being part of a secret ring of pedophiles. And Pizzagate, the most famous of those conspiracy theories, she also tweeted last year about Seth Rich. Now, Seth Rich, Seth Rich was the Democratic National Committee staffer who was shot in Washington, D.C., echoing a conservative theory that his death was covered up by the Clintons. Uh, and Roseanne Barr tweeted, the fix is in. Now, uh, Fox News had to retract. Fox News had to retract this story. And a few months ago, somebody called somebody called into the show and tried to argue that Fox News didn't do it, and then I had to provide them with the article that Fox News did uh, retract that story on Seth Rich. But even though they retracted the story, um, uh, conspiracy theorist um, Sean Hannity, okay, kept running with the bit. He kept going with the story, all right? And Sean Hannity's not a journalist. Sean Hannity has basically no credibility whatsoever, all right? Uh, why he's still on Fox News, I mean, um, you know, I really don't understand this, all right? But NBC News uh, had an article as well as um, uh, NPR.com, NPR or NPR.org, which one is it? Let's bring it up. Uh, NPR.org, Fox News retracts D DNC staffer um, uh, story of Seth Rich. Fox News retracts DNC staffer conspiracy story, but, Han but Hannity keeps it alive. This is from May 24th, 2017. So if anybody doubts this, you can go research this yourself. Fox News retracts DNC staffer conspiracy story, but Hannity keeps it alive. Okay? And also, Fox News is being sued by the family of Seth Rich as well. All right? We're going to post this article on the thread of our broadcast so you can, so you can check this out. Okay? But this is, th this is all this stuff that she's that Roseanne Barr tweeted all in the same day. Okay. And then, you know, it caused people to, it caused people to ask the question, you know, what's wrong with it. Okay. This is, this is not normal, but we know a lot of Donald Trump supporters <laughs> are not normal. Okay. But this is, is like, you know, you can afford, she's somebody who can afford to get mental help. If she is something's wrong with her. Right. And when you research this, cause I have a number of different articles. We don't have time to get into all of them. The co-stars of the show said that they, you know, focused on keeping her off of Twitter before the show came back on the air, the reboot of the show, right? So the grill.com has a good article uh, dealing with um, Channing Dungy, Channing Dungy. Now, Channing Dungy is the African-American female who is the president of the ABC Entertainment, and she's the one to pull the plug on Roseanne's show. Now, personally... The show should have never been revamped in the first place because uh, if you look at some of the statements she's, uh, Roseanne Barr's made in the past, it should have never been rebooted in the first place. But ABC wanted to capitalize on the Trump voters 
and see how they can speak to the Trump voters and market to the Trump voters. So they had this show, and on the show, Roseanne O'Connor, who's the role that uh, Roseanne Barr plays, she's a Donald Trump supporter. So they dealt with they dealt with some of this in the first season. In the second season, they had already said that they were going to move away from politics and deal more with family issues. But read this article from um, thegrio.com, Five Things to Know About Black ABC President Channing Dungy, who canceled Roseanne after, racist, after her racist rant. Five Things to Know About Black ABC President Channing Dungy, who canceled Roseanne after her racist rant. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that you have some conservatives who say, well, this is just free speech from Roseanne and she should not be fired, right? But these are some of the same people who say Colin Kaepernick should be fired or Colin Kaepernick should not play again in the NFL, and they're telling black NFL players to shut up and stop kneeling and stop disrespecting the flag, right, and just play ball, okay? Well, first of all, they don't get paid to uh it's not they don't get paid to uh stand for the national anthem number one they get paid to play okay they are doing a silent protest taking a knee they're doing a silent protest and taking a knee comes from the military that's part of their first amendment right okay they're not calling people names they're not disrespecting people they're calling attention to the oppression of african americans and people of color by protesting during the national anthem all right so instead of saying well wait a second why don't we well, why don't we see what the protest is about, okay? Why don't we see how we can uh, help address these issues? People just want to say, no, shut up. We don't want to hear from you. Be quiet, all right? But at the same time, some of these same people who say the NFL players should stand, should stand for the national anthem, when they're sitting at home watching the football game and the national anthem comes on, they don't stand up in their living rooms. When they're at the sports bar and the national anthem comes on during the football game, they don't stand up for the national anthem. OK, but they but they but they want to attack African-American football players who are calling attention to police brutality, the oppression of African-Americans and people of color. Now, if we look at what Colin Kaepernick said and you can look at the uh, article from Daily Mail uk and other articles cited this as well. This is back from August 2000, uh, August 28th, 2016, defiant 49er quarterback Colin Kaepernick faces mounting anger as he insists he will continue to sit for the national anthem at NFL games and protest at the oppression of black people. Now, this is um, just a few days after the protest uh, was recognized, just a couple of days, because it was recognized uh, that the, the game against the preseason game against the Green Bay Packers, August 26, um, 2016. And this is the two days after that. Colin Kaepernick said, when there's significant change, first he, said, first he said, I'm going to continue to stand with the people that are being oppressed. Okay, he said that that Sunday. The preseason game was on a Friday. So he said this on Sunday. He said, to me, this is something that has to change. He said, when there's significant change, and I feel like that flag represents what it's supposed to represent, this country is representing people the way that it's supposed to, I'll stand. Now, the same people, who tell Colin Kaepernick to shut up, the same people who attack NFL players and tell them just play ball because, see, you have a lot of white people that, who, who, number one, resent wealthy African-American football players, and they just, want, they just want to be entertained by them, okay? The, a lot of these same people then want to talk about uh, Roseanne Barr's First Amendment right, and she's telling a, a racially tinged joke about somebody else. OK, so you have a you have a hypocrisy here. You have a hypocrisy here. And then at the same time, they don't want to call out Donald Trump for attacking the NFL players and, and, and saying at a campaign rally in Alabama, uh, wouldn't you like to see one of these owners uh, fire one of these SOBs when they when they don't stand for the national anthem? OK, and at the same time, they don't want to deal with the history of the national anthem. September 13th, 1814. A white supremacist, a slave owner named Francis Scott Key, writes the defense of Fort McHenry during the War of 1812, and he thought that African people were mentally inferior, and he used his position as district attorney to Washington, D.C., to fight against abolitionists who were trying to free enslaved Africans. This is who Francis Scott Key was, who wrote 
the, the point called Defense of Fort McHenry, which later became known as the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, we don't have to talk about the third stanza that talks about no refuge for the hiding on the slave. The entire song is a white supremacist song. So, so, so this is what happens when you don't understand history. The entire song is a white supremacist song. It ain't just the third stanza. No, it's the entire song. Okay? And if you, if you watch the uh, lecture that I did called The Racist History of the White National Anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance, I deal with the whole history of both of them, the National Anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance was written in August of 1892 by a white Baptist minister who was a socialist. So most Republicans who stand for the Pledge of Allegiance don't know it was written by a socialist because they don't do research. They don't understand history, many of them. Not all of them, but many of them don't understand history. Okay? All right. Call in number 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600. Is the call in number. If you have a question or comment, listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel, 313 778 7600 is the call in number. So we're talking about uh, Roseanne Barr's show being canceled. Now, this is on the same day that uh, this is on the same day that uh, Starbucks had their um, implicit bias training. Okay, very interesting. So there was an article from um, Philly.com, Philadelphia Inquirer. It's an article from Philly.com uh, about the Starbucks training. And we know that uh, Roseanne went on to blame uh, Wanda Sykes. We know Wanda Sykes uh, was a consultant on the show. And, and before the show was canceled, Wanda Sykes said uh, she was not returning to the show. Personally, I don't know why the hell Wanda was there in the first place. I'm glad the sister came to her senses. I don't know why you were there in the first place. Uh, and then we know that uh, even uh, uh, she allu- uh, even Roseanne Barr uh, alluded uh, to uh, a conspiracy theory that Michelle Obama was behind uh, her show being canceled. OK, so you, now there's two African-American women you don't you don't mess with. OK, one is Michelle Obama. The other one's Beyonce. OK, I'm just saying <laughs> you don't mess with Michelle Obama. You don't mess with Beyonce. But Atlanta Black Star dot com has this article. Roseanne Barr blasted for blaming Michelle Obama for show getting pulled. OK, so she's just blaming everything. Then she tried to blame it on Ambien. OK, Ambien responded on social media. They said um, racism is not a known side effect for taking Ambien. Ambien. OK, so she's just going, you know, I think she really needs some uh I think she needs some uh, really some mental help. But it's a good thing, Roseanne, because see, Obamacare covers pre-existing conditions. Okay, so they can help you. All right. <laughs> Obamacare covers pre-existing conditions. So uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com has this article, and it says uh, the comedian on Wednesday retweeted a post from one of her supporters named Josh Cornett who claimed former First Lady Michelle Obama had a hand in pushing ABC Entertainment President Channing Dungey uh, to scrap uh, Roseanne's show, scrap Roseanne. And uh, the tweet said, breaking according to sources, which sources are you referring to, ABC President Channing Dungey had a long conversation via phone with former First Lady Michelle Obama, okay, uh, who will forever be my First Lady, uh, before deciding to cancel the Roseanne show. Okay, this was tweeted by Josh Cornett. Uh, And Josh Cornett's biography says uh, he's probably uh, blocked by the likes of Barack Obama and MSNBC. Uh, Quote, Michelle Obama was reportedly enraged and insisted an apology was inadequate, dot, 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 developing, end quote. Okay, now there's no evidence to support this. Okay, Channing Dungey announced Tuesday that the network would no longer Air Roseanne uh, uh, after Roseanne Barr's tweets about uh, Valerie Jarrett, et cetera, okay? Uh, now, before we tweet in the conspiracy theory, Roseanne Barr asked Josh Cornett if the post was true, but it seems she at least thought it, quote, makes a lot of sense uh, uh, than most things, end quote, as, as that's what she, uh, as, that, as, that what, as that's what she, quote, retreat, retweeted, from another Twitter user named Jimmy Holland, okay? So check this out also. So just some more conspiracy theory nonsense uh, floating around, all right? So uh, it seems like she really needs help, but Obamacare covers uh, preexisting conditions, okay? Let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to Vic 
Hey, Vic, thanks for holding. Uh, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. Uh, I'm calling from Detroit. Okay, from Detroit. Go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, I have a comment um, about um, um, what's what's the lady's name? Uh, Roseanne. Roseanne Barr. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, from my observation, you know, ain't she in her seventies? Is she past her sixties yet? Is she in her seventies? I don't think she's in the seventies. I'm not exactly okay, sure how old well, she is, but I don't think she's in the seventies. Well, anyhow, she's a senior because I know she in her sixties. I know she passed her fifty. So, what I want to say about her or in regard to her is she just need to go sit down somewhere because, you know, she's looking old and tired and ugly. And I don't know what's wrong with these people on trying to demonize other people to put other people down. What is it supposed to uh, make her look better? And the same goes for Donald Trump with all his bashing and smashing and talking about everybody. Is that really supposed to make him look better? I, I really don't think so. Right. Well, he, he's um, he's appealing to his base, but that's who Trump has been, man, for decades. But he he's appealing. He's appealing to his base. He's trying to galvanize his base. He's trying to make sure they don't leave him. Uh, and he's trying to appeal to his base so then he can discredit the Mueller investigation also. That is well, intensifying. Well, yeah. how well, I just want to say it like this. Mm -hmm. What in the heck is wrong with America? to stand by and allow this to go down because I, I follow the news intently, not okay. just local news, but okay. national, international news. Mm -hmm. And as it's standing right now, that Trump is um, Trump is sticking his finger, middle finger up at democracy, and he's trying to do a revenge for what happened to Nixon because I don't know if you know it or not, mm -hmm. Richard Nixon has reportedly been uh, – uh, Trump's um, idol and hero. He, oh, we yeah. just don't know that. And well, no, I know that. Of, and then on top of that, how is a couple of Trump's attorneys going to send a 20-page letter to, letter to Mueller and his team mm -hmm. telling them that it's no way that you can um, indict a sitting president and he can't be charged with obstruction of justice because, in other words, he is above the law and he's the top well, law enforcement officer. And um, that something must be about to go down. Well, 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 well first of all, uh, one, they can send whatever they want to the Mueller, but doesn't mean that it's con it doesn't mean that it's constitutionally sound. And that's not constitutionally sound, one. Number two, they actually drafted that about four months ago. We just found out about it. We just found out about it a couple of days ago. I think the news broke Friday. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, the news either broke Friday or Saturday. So they can send it to Mueller, but it doesn't mean that it's constitutionally sound. Um, United States versus Nixon proved that the president can be indicted, the president can be subpoenaed, and that no man is above the law. Okay, Nixon versus um, United States versus Nixon proved that. Okay, and if you watch MSC, MSNBC today and also yesterday, uh, law professor Lawrence Tribe uh, broke that down, and you can go to MSNBC.com and you can actually uh, see the video. He broke that down, so uh, th that was settled with uh, United States versus Nixon. Okay. All right. Oh, of course it was. Of course it was. I follow that, and I do follow MSNBC yeah. and a few other 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 top notch uh, reputable uh, news sources every right. day. Um, right. MSNBC being one of them, but but I just find it um, outrageous and appalling that this man has been in office uh, this long, and the Republicans and the Congress just stand by and allow this man to just do whatever he wants to do and say whatever he wants to say. Okay. And um, um, that banner guy just said it um, when he came to Michigan a few days ago right. that it's no longer the Republican Party. It's the Trump Party. Now, mm -hmm. that, that that's a damning statement. Right. Now, some Republicans disagree with that. But at the same time, uh, I think Trump in the uh, I think Trump is going to cause an implosion uh, of the Republican Party. OK, but thanks for calling. Man. I got to get these other calls. Thanks for calling. OK, so um, what people have to understand is this is why midterm elections are so important. The Mueller case, the Mueller investigation is going to is going to uh, take its course. OK, um, once it takes its course, it, once it uh, plays out, then it's going to be up to the Department of Justice. Now, we're not sure who's going to be at the Department of Justice because some uh, people are saying, well, uh, Rosenstein is not going to be able to make a recommendation because he's going to be a witness because he was involved in the firing of James Comey. OK, but. 
what happens is is um, the legal process is uh, based upon the findings of Mueller, and it's gonna be it's gonna be damning. Uh, is what we see now is just the tip of the iceberg. I guarantee you, uh, there are gonna be more indictments. I guarantee you, and they're gonna be some indictments of Americans. All right, um, but the impeachment process is um, the process of indicting a president and putting a president on trial. So it starts in the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives draws up articles of impeachment. Okay, you need 218 votes in the House of Representatives because there are 435 members in the House of Representatives. You need 218 votes to impeach a president. This is why midterm elections are so important because, see, when you study, when you, when you study Watergate, right, Repub- Democrats had the majority in the House and the Senate. And the Democrats drew up articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. First article of impeachment was obstruction of justice. Second article of impeachment was abuse of power. Republicans went to Nixon and told him, look, the Democrats have the majority. The Democrats are, you know, the, the, the votes exist in the Senate to find you guilty. And they basically told him, look, for the good of America, you need to resign. They, the Republicans put pressure on Nixon to resign. Okay. So August 9th, 1974, Richard Nixon resigned from office. Even though articles of impeachment were drawn up against him, he was not put on trial. Okay. So once article once it passes the House, then the trial is held in the U.S. Senate. So this, this is why midterm elections are so important. November 6, 2018, you're gonna have you're gonna have a huge turnout. Because people are starting to understand the importance of the House of Representatives, representatives the importance of the U.S. Senate, the, the, the role that the U.S. Senate plays in uh, nominating uh, Supreme Court justices, the role that the U.S. Senate plays in nominating um, uh, cabinet secretaries, things like this, Secretary of Education, um, uh, the uh, Secretary of uh, the um, Attorney General. All, the, all, these are appro- all these are confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Okay. So and then the other thing is that uh, so you're going to have this take place in 2018 then 2020. What a lot of people are not talking about in 2020. And I'm not even thinking about who's going to run for president. We got to focus on midterm elections. But what a lot of people are not talking about for 2020 is you're going to have 12 million 18 year olds who will be eligible to vote for the first time. Fifty percent of them are people of color. And the overwhelming majority of the 12 million 18 year olds are not going to vote Republican. And and this right here is scaring a lot of Republicans. A lot of Republicans are focusing on this. Okay. All right. So um, 313-778-7600 is a calling number. If you have a question or comment, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit uh, about Starbucks and their training. Then I want to get into um, this uh, presentation that a Peter Bailey did, who's a journalist, a uh, former writer for the uh, Organization of Afro-American Unities uh, newspaper. We'll deal with a comparative analysis between Dr. King and Malcolm X. And then uh, I'm going to share with you this um, uh, interview that uh, NBC News did with Dr. King May 8th, 1967, uh, a few months before Dr. King was assassinated. Okay, you don't want to miss this. Dr. King dealt with um, after civil rights and uh, black power and the black power movement. Hey, you listen to the African History Network show, 910A on the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910A on the Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Today is uh, Sunday, June 3rd, 2018, and we are live uh, today. Um, shout out to everybody watching us on Facebook and on YouTube, on YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. Also, um, w- uh, check out after this show, check out the uh, broadcast I did earlier in the day dealing with um, M- MSNBC's uh, special this past Tuesday called Everyday Racism. Okay, I did a uh, Facebook Live broadcast and on YouTube I uh, dealt with uh, three problems with um, their special Everyday Racism. Uh, the first problem is they did not define from a historical perspective what racism is. And that's problematic because how are you going to fight what you don't understand? Racism is a system of advantage and privilege, advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism exists when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, privileges, benefits, land, access to education, access to opportunity, and they use that to marginalize, subordinate, 
and do harm to another race of people. That's what racism is, okay? Um, not liking people and calling people racial epithets and things like this. That's not racism. That's bigotry, all right? So uh, check that out because I went through, we did uh, two hours in that broadcast and uh, went through and broke it down. All right, so we, we have a new uh, bundle pack as well available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It is the um, it is the uh, Black Panther uh, online course and DVD bundle pack where you get uh, 10 of the online courses that I teach as well as uh, six of my DVD presentations. That's uh, all on sale. That's uh, in a bundle pack. And it includes um, the online course Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, okay? Uh, that's included in that. That's a um, seven-session online. Um, that's a 14-hour seven-session online course. There are other uh, online classes in that bundle pack, like uh, Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization, African American Resistance in the Era of Donald Trump, Voter Suppression, Reparations, and High Elections Have Consequences. Okay, so that is a um, it's a online course bundle pack. All the courses are on demand, and it includes uh, six DVD presentations as well. Okay, and includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. So that is the uh, Black Panther. Um, online course and uh, six DVD bundle pack. And we'll post a link here on the thread. It's at, available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post the uh, uh, link on the thread of the broadcast here on Facebook and YouTube also, okay? All right, let's go back to the phone lines. Let's go to, uh, we have, let's go to Tony, okay? Tony, line two. Hey, Tony, thanks for holding. Welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us uh, where you're calling from. Thank you, Michael, um, in Detroit. Okay, go ahead with your question or comment. Okay, uh, comment real real quick, and then uh, I want to jump into uh, what you were going to talk about right on, in this hour. I just wanted to say that did you hear number 45 uh, praise uh, Roseanne's ratings and oh, yeah. said her show was about us? Now, he mm -hmm. has convinced his uh constituency, you know, his base, mm -hmm. that he's one of them. And that is so ridiculous. And I don't know how how clueless you could be to think that he he thinks that his his base is dumb. He even said it in uh, one of the debates with Hillary. It's like, how stupid are Americans? And, I mean, and he even said, he's like, you know what, all I have to do is appeal to this middle middle American base, and I can win, and right. it actually worked. Well, well, here, here, here's what happened, uh, Trump, and I talked about this in my Facebook Live broadcast earlier. Trump appealed to the fears of mm -hmm. a brown, to the fears of a Browning of America, to mm -hmm. to many white Americans, non salaried workers, older, uh, non college educated, uh, older white Americans. He appealed. Uh, and honed in on the uh, their fear of the browning of America. He convinced right. them that the reason why you don't have a job, the reason why times are hard for you is because of those people, is because of Mexicans, is because of Hispanics mm -hmm. taking your jobs, things like this, right? So uh, what, what, what he didn't say is that uh, since um, uh, the 1980s, factory output has doubled, and corporations are doing it with one-third of the labor force. Because of automation, because of software programs, because of robotics, things like this, okay? Uh, right. and, and at the same time, uh, during the last year of President Obama's tenure, you had about right around 5.5, 5.6 million unfilled jobs in the country. Today, it's about 6.4, right around 6.4 or so million, 6.5 million unfilled jobs in the country, okay? Now, yeah. so if you got all these unfilled jobs... How are you going to blame that on Hispanics? How are you going to blame that on Mexicans? How are you going to blame right. that on immigrants? Okay? So the, so uh, people need to look at the uh, articles from uh, – one One was a, a good article from uh, theatlantic.com, and I've talked mm -hmm. about it before. And this deals with uh, how it was cultural anxiety, not um, economic uh, – not economic anxiety that uh, – 
cause mm-hmm. people to vote for Trump. Okay, there have been a number of studies mm-hmm. that look that look at this. The most recent one was uh, probably from December fifteenth, two thousand seventeen, uh, and that was published by Vox dot com. Uh, the past year of research has made it very clear Trump won because of racial resentment. The past year right. of research has made it very clear Trump won because of racial resentment. Another study produces the same findings we've seen over and over again. Okay, so that's from uh, December fifteenth, two thousand seventeen. Then when we look at the uh, when we look at the article from uh, the Atlantic dot com from May nineteenth, two thousand seventeen, it was cultural anxiety that drove white working class voters to Trump. It was cultural right. anxiety. Now, cultural anxiety is a euphemism. It's a nice way of saying white supremacy. Okay? Exactly. And, and so people need to read this. Theatlantic.com. This is from May 9, 2017. It was cultural anxiety that drove white working class voters to Trump. A new study finds that fear of societal change, fear of societal change, not economic mm-hmm. pressure, not economic pressure, motivated votes for Trump among non-salaried workers without college degrees. So they felt that their life was changing, their way of life was changing, and many people, so when Trump talks about make America great again, this was a throwback to a camp, mm-hmm. to, to, to a campaign, uh, uh, this was a throwback to a campaign slogan from uh, uh, Ronald Reagan called Let's Make America mm-hmm. uh, Great Again. Put it on hold. That, uh, called Let's Make America Great Again. Okay, that was a throwback. We'll come back to you in just a minute, Tony. And then um, oh, so you had a lot of you had a lot of white people who want to go back to Mayberry, Andy Griffith. Uh, they want to go back to Ain't B, Opie. They want to go back to those days, Ozzy and Harriet, Leave It to Beaver. Prior to the Civil Rights Act of '64, prior to the Voting Rights Act of '65, prior to desegregation, May seventeenth, nineteen fifty-four, U.S. Supreme Court case. Um, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. That's when that ruling came down. May, they want to go. They want to go back prior to all of that. So make America great again was dog whistling to those people who long for the days of yesterday. Okay, and this this is what this stuff is all about. This is why I warn black people: you need to get up off your black ass and go vote to stop this fool from getting in office. But people didn't want to listen. Okay, now he's reversed over 100 policies that President Obama had in place. Oh, the stuff that I predicted, unfortunately, is coming true. I told people what was going to happen, all right? And this is why midterm elections are so important, okay? Because you got to understand how to block some of this stuff, okay? This is why midterm elections are so important. This is why the 2020 election is so important as well. Let's go back to Tony uh, for her closing statements. Okay, Tony, go ahead and finish, then I got to go to uh, Sandra on line three. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely uh, agree with everything you said. And, uh, you know, the dog whistle uh, resonated. But guess what? What he's, the policies he's enacting, especially the tariffs, uh, it's not going to benefit his base or anyone else. Because right. if he uh, does that deal, then the prices of our goods and services are going to uh, be. Um, increased. I mean, his whole, uh, he makes no logical sense at all, period. Well, no, no, he doesn't make any logical sense, but he didn't make any logical sense uh, during the election. Uh, Never. But, but, but what happened was, <laughs> what happened was people voted for him because they voted out of cultural anxiety, white supremacy, racism, and sexism as well. Okay, sexism, uh, 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 Islamophobia. He made uh, uh, Muslims the, the the boogeyman. He made uh, undocumented immigrants as well as legal immigrants. He made them all the boogeyman. And you had these people that voted for him, and they're getting screwed because those those farmers that grow soybeans, they're getting screwed by these tariffs. Okay, so this is uh, I hate to say I told you so, but okay, all right. Hey, okay. right. Thanks. Okay, thanks for calling, Tony. All right, let's go to Sandra. Hey, Sandra, line three. Thanks for uh, holding. Tell us uh, where you're calling from, Sandra. I'm calling from Macomb, Michigan. Macomb, Michigan. All right, go ahead with you. Thanks, thanks for holding. Uh, go ahead with your question or comment. Okay, my, my question is this. I wonder what happened to that 13-year-old child, Trump Wait. He molested. Right. Well, so I heard about that case, and uh, we have to say allegedly. Uh, Because that's a legal issue. Uh, I heard about that case. And from my understanding, 
Um, Mm -hmm. she dropped the charges. She's not going from my understanding of this, because I I did read about that, um, uh, about the allegations. She's not going forward with the, uh, legal process from my understanding of that. Um, Mm -hmm. so uh, oftentimes when, well, it may not even be money. It, it, It could be. So what happens is oftentimes when, um, you have, uh, charges like that, one, when it comes to Trump, his base will attack people on social media, will attack the victim, the alleged victim on social media, one. Two, even if that wasn't the case, um, the person has to decide if they want to come forward and deal with the media scrutiny, deal with the accusations, deal with the questions. They have to decide, do they want to go through with that? It's, it's one thing when it's somebody like a teacher in the school that the uh, allegations are against, or even, say, a local city council person or a local mayor is much different when it's the president of the United States. And you have some people, and I don't, I can't say I blame them. You have some people, especially someone that young, allegedly, you have some people who don't want to go through all that, okay? So I don't know exactly what it was there, okay? And don't want to really, uh, don't want to uh, speculate, say, hey, was this or that or whatever. But I do know that uh, from hearing from the women who have brought allegations against Trump, they get uh, beat up on social media by uh, a lot of Trump supporters. Okay. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Next thing I want to know, um, Trump opened the door for Russia mm-hmm. to investigate Hillary Clinton. He opened that door up right there. And uh, on media, he, he, on live he, TV, everybody know that. He, oh, oh, he, so you're saying when he uh, said, Russia, if you're listening. Uh, no, no, he said, I'm going to have, I'm going to have uh, the President Putin of Russia to investigate Hillary Clinton. When did he say that? When, when they was running for election. Oh, he said it. Well, he said he's going to, he said he was going to have his attorney general. Open up an investigation. No, that he was gonna. Ha- no, he said he's gonna have President Putin to investigate Hillary Clinton okay. on national TV. Okay, e- email that. Now I need e- to go e- back e- and e- see e- that. Email me that documentation at info info at africanhistorynetwork dot com. Mm-hmm. Because I saw mm-hmm. three. I saw all three debates, and I reported on all three debates, and I and I don't I don't remember that at all. All right, mm-hmm. info info and, and, at africanhistorynetwork dot com. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, okay. So Starbucks had um, their implicit bias training this past Tuesday, May 29th. Well, this stuff took place on May 29th, right? And um, Philly.com, which is the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, they had an article about this Starbucks closes stores for anti-racial bias recap. And, um, uh, they they talked about the training that took place in more than 8,000 U.S. stores on May 29th, while nearly 175,000 employees undergo training, quote, geared toward preventing discrimination in our stores, end quote. All right. Now, Starbucks is by no means thinking they're going to um, fight against implicit bias with one training, but they're saying this is the start. OK, so Tuesday's training session at Starbucks and the related events grew out of an incident that occurred April 12th. We know two African-American men uh, arrested at the 18th and Spruce, Spruce Streets uh, uh, Starbucks. OK, now Malik Young, who's 28 years old, who works at a uh, center city Starbucks, said he thought that the training was going well. Um, he said, um, I do think people are learning. Um, this was one Philly Starbucks employee who said of the training. He said, I do think people are learning. Uh, he said outside the, uh, the Lowe's uh, hotel where the training was held, uh, quote, and if they aren't, I am end quote. Now, Jordan Crockett, 21 years old, who also works at one of the, um, coffee chains, uh, center, uh, city stores said he thought the conversations were productive, especially from a store manager's perspective. He said his takeaway from the presentation was to quote, treat people as people, treat people as people. Now, considering this is 2018 and the major corporation had to shut down thousands of stores to teach employees to be inclusive and not discriminate. Uh, he quipped quote, it's a shame, but at least it's happening End quote. All right. 
Now, uh, in a meeting with the Philadelphia Inquirer and Daily News, Starbucks CEO Kevin Johnson called the anti-bias training, uh, quote, one step in a uh, journey, one step in a journey, end quote. He said the uh, company uh, worked with 30 experts to create the training and that part of the session features videos in which a Starbucks board member, a store manager, and experts from the Perception Institute, a group that seeks to reduce discrimination, talk about topics like racial anxiety and and personal bias versus structural bias, okay? Now, I, I'm pretty sure they never define racism from a historical perspective, and racism being a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes from the ideology of European white supremacy, okay? And how stereotypes are being propagated by the media, okay, which influences the way people think, feel, act, and behave. All right, now, after watching the videos, employees uh, will split into groups of two or three to discuss uh, further. Uh, Kevin is CEO Kevin Johnson and COO Rosalind Brewer, who's an African-American woman who was the former um, CEO of uh, Sam's Club. Okay, Sam's Club. And now she's on the she she was on the board of um Starbucks and then in September of two thousand seventeen, Rosalind Brewer was promoted to chief operating officer of uh Starbucks. Okay. Uh so Kevin Johnson and COO Rosalind Brewer said it was quote emotionally exhausting, end quote, when they went through it. All right. So check out this article here because this is an extensive article. I don't have time to get through all this. Uh, Starbucks closes stores for anti-racial bias training recap. This is from uh, May 29th, 2018, Philly.com, Philadelphia Inquirer. And I subscribe to the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the many uh, news outlets I subscribe to. Uh, Starbucks closes stores for anti-racial bias training recap. Hey, if you want to donate to the African History Network, <laughs> you can do so at paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Because I got to pay for all these uh, news subscriptions that I have. Washington Post, New York Times, I canceled mine to the uh, Wall Street Journal because I don't like Rupert Murdoch, who owns the Wall Street Journal. He also owns the Fox uh, News Network. And he also owns Fox TV network that shows Empire. Imagine that. Okay. All right. Now, uh, news1.com had a really good article. News1.com is African American owned and operated. Here's what Starbucks workers learned at the company wide day of anti bias training. Here's what Starbucks workers learned at the company wide day of anti bias training. Starbucks tried to teach its workers not to be racist, but, an anti -bias, but can anti bias training actually work? Okay. And they had an update to the story after the training took place. And they talk about how um, uh, before whole hours of anti-bias training that Starbucks forces employees to undergo on Tuesday was greeted with skepticism at best and characterized as a colossal failure at worst, according to a report from The Cut, the publication The Cut. While in theory the training was offered with the greatest of intentions, to rid workers of an implicit racial bias, to, to rid workers of any implicit, implicit racial biases they may have, quote, the training was a waste of four hours, end quote, said one worker. Now, this is not all uh, 175,000 employees, okay, but this is what one employee said, uh, who, like the others, requested an anonymity, all right? Now, another employee said, quote, the training only really covered how to not be racist towards African Americans, uh, and this uh, worker is in Minnesota. Uh, uh, this employee said, quote, don't get me wrong. That needed to be addressed. But a lot of the baristas at my store hoped it would touch base on other forms of discrimination towards people of color and marginalized people, end quote. And keep in mind, even Kevin Johnson, CEO of Starbucks, said this is just the first step. So there's going to be other training as well. Now, one worker in Florida, Florida found the training borderline insulting. This employee said, quote, another thing that has upset me was that they expect us to always be on and wel and be welcoming even when customers don't treat us with uh, respect and dignity in return, uh, this employee said. Now, one white female employee in Indiana said she was uh, said was a bit uh, she said she was a bit offended. Quote, a few of my coworkers and I found the terminology, quote unquote, color brave uh, that was used uh, to be strange. Uh, it was meant to serve as an antithesis to the idea of being colorblind. 
uh, regarding race, but we felt that it was an offensive way to approach viewing other races. See, first thing you have to do when you have conversations like this, you need a history lesson because most people are totally ignorant when it comes to history. You need a history lesson. You have to talk about the history of this country. You have to deal with the history of white supremacy and slavery. You have to deal with the uh, white supremacy and racism. You have to deal with the history of slavery. You have to deal with the history of stereotypes, okay, and the and the history of the stratification of races. People like Dr. Uh, Carl von Linnaeus and Dr. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. You got to you have to deal with this history. You got to deal with why do you have uh, if there were only eleven states in the Confederacy the Confederate States of America, if there were only 11 states in the Confederacy, why do you have Confederate monuments in 31 states in America? Because they were erected to terrorize African Americans and keep us in our place. you got to deal with this type of history before you can start trying to address implicit bias. We'll be back in a few minutes to listen to the African History Network show, 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future of radio. When we come back, we'll deal with comparative analysis, Dr. King and Malcolm X. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. A. am your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Uh, it's Sunday, June uh, 3rd, 2018, and uh, coming up you know, a few days before my birthday. Wow, another year is going by. Uh, <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, those in Atlanta, I will be in Atlanta in June and in July, back to back. I'll be, uh, I'll be speaking at the huge Juneteenth uh, celebration. Uh, was it June 15th through the 17th at Morris Brown College? Uh, I speak on Saturday. Uh, we'll get that information up at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I have a vendor table there. I'll be doing some presentations at the Historian Tent. So that's Juneteenth, uh, June uh, 15th through the 17th in Atlanta. And then the following, uh, and then the following month, July, the third weekend in July, I'll be at the Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo, the Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo um, in Atlanta, okay? So um, I'm, I'll be talking to Queen Thais uh, this weekend and, and uh, nailing everything down. I'm usually there um, the third weekend in July. I'm usually in Atlanta, and I'm usually one of the presenters also for the Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo. Go to liberatedmindsexpo.com liberatedmindsexpo.com uh, for more information, okay? All right, let's see here. Uh, let's go back to the phone lines. Then we got to get into, uh, we got one more call I need to get to uh, before we get into this clip here uh, dealing with uh, Dr. King and Malcolm X. Let's go to uh, Joe. Joe's been waiting. Uh, thanks for holding. Joe, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. I'm calling from Metro Detroit. I just want to say, you know, I listen to this program from time to time, and it's very, very educational. Oh, thank you. Enlightening. And it's sad that so many of us mm -hmm. really don't know our history. Yes. And we quit to argue about things, and we make ourselves look like a fool when we don't have the history to back us up. Right. A lot of us think we know history, mm -hmm. but you really have to study it. Yes. You really have to do an in-depth study on the various aspects of history so that when you putting yourself out there, mm -hmm. you're standing on a solid footing. Absolutely. A foundation that's strong. Yep. And I see so many. I listen, but what I want to ask you, when you was talking about um uh, Colin Castor, I think, believe it was Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you was talking about uh, um, dang, oh, the, the devil just took that right out of me. Protesting against it the flag. Was he said, "I'll stand for the flag uh, once it uh, once it represents what it's right. supposed to represent." Yeah, what it's supposed to represent. Right. The sad thing about that, we've been saluting that flag for years. Mm -hmm. And giving that flag everything it don't represent, right? And nobody was saying nothing. Nobody was really saying nothing. Mm -hmm. And when you find out what the flag really represents, right? It don't represent us, right? Yeah, yeah, largely. And you've had people like 
Jackie Robinson, who a lot of white people love. Well, a lot of people don't know that Jackie Robinson later in life in his uh his uh, his autobiography, I think it came out in 1973, called I Never Had a Maid, he talks about why he could not salute the flag anymore. He talks about why he could not stand up for the national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. He talks about this in his book. And this guy was a World War II veteran, okay, Jackie Robinson, who broke the color barrier in 1947, Brooklyn Dodgers. He talked about in his autobiography why he could not stand for the national anthem anymore and the Pledge of Allegiance. I have one question. Go ahead. How can we ever really be free if those that know and don't speak on, mm-hmm. those pretend, you know, not to know what they know, right. those that know don't stand on truth? Mm-hmm. Well, you, you know, you have to tell, you have to have people to tell the truth and, and have the courage to tell the truth and teach the history. That's why it's extremely important. But I know that this history, mm-hmm. like you got it, yes. you studied, right. and you uh, turned over rocks, mm-hmm. and you spent many hours engaged in study. Well, years. I mean, I've been studying 26 years, but go ahead. Who's coming? A lot of folks, <laughs> a lot of folks have read a number of books, mm-hmm. but that that's good. Right. You, from listening to you, you went more in depth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And the research. Absolutely. And I feel really ashamed mm-hmm. a lot of stuff because I'm 59 years old in the June the 27th of June. Okay. Being on this planet 59 years, mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff I didn't even know. Right. Right. I understand. June 10th. Right. I, don't, I didn't know what that meant. Right. Exactly. Never right. heard about it. Right. I understand. Well, keep listening, man. You know, keep, keep, keep listening. Keep listening to the show. Do you have internet access at home? No. Okay, but keep listening to the show here. We're here Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, okay? I got to get to this other segment, but keep listening. Cause, Appreciate it. Because this other segment going to blow you away. Okay, so uh, May 19th was the 93rd uh, anniversary of the birth of Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, right? So at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, uh, we had the pleasure of having as a, as a speaker uh, A. Peter Bailey. A. Peter Bailey. Now, A. Peter Bailey was a friend of Malcolm X. He was also uh, a member of the Organization of Afro American Unity, and he wrote for uh, the newspaper for the Organization of Afro American Unity. And he did a comparative analysis of um, Malcolm X and Dr. King, and he looked at passages of their speeches. From toward the end of both of their lives, dealing with different topics, okay? Here is an excerpt of what he talked about. And unite bananas with scattered leaves. That's Brother Malcolm again on the question of unity. But there's not that much difference between what Dr. King said and what Brother Malcolm said about unity. That's where I think there could be some conversation. By the economics, Dr. King said, Black power is also a call for the pooling of black financial resources to achieve economic security. While the ultimate answer to the Negro's economic dilemma will be found in a massive federal program for all poor along the lines of A. Philip Randolph's freedom budget, a kind of Marshall plan for the disadvantaged. That is something that the Negro himself can do to throw off the shackles of poverty. Although the Negro is still at the bottom of the economic ladder, his collective annual income is up to $30 billion. This gives him a considerable buying power that can make the difference between profit and loss in many businesses. Through the pooling of such resources and the development of habits of thrift and techniques of wise investment, the Negro will be doing his share to grapple with his problems of economic uh, deprivation. If black power means the development of this kind of strength within the Negro community, then it's a quest for basic, necessary, legitimate power. That's Dr. King, y'all. That's Dr. Yeah. King. Absolutely. You know, my Luther, I have a dream. That's what you all you all hear. That's all you hear about him. Now, Brother Malcolm was economics. The economic philosophy of black nationalism means that every church and every civic organization and every fraternal order is tied down for our people to become conscious of the importance of controlling the economy of our communities. If we own the stores, if we operate the businesses, if we try and establish some industry in our, in our communities, there, 
then we are developing to the position where we are creating employment for our own kind. Once you gain control of the economy of your own community, then you don't have to beg and pick it and beg some other, uh, some other people downtown for a job in his business. Again, you see those two positions? That's a negotiating space in there where you can sit down and talk and maybe work out a useful thing about the area of economics. Education. Education. Dr. King on, on Brother Malcolm on education. Education is an important element in the, in the struggle for human rights. It is, the, it, it, it is the means to help our children and our people discover their identity and thereby increase their self-respect. Education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who, people who prepare for today. We must unite our efforts and spread our own program for self-improvement through education to every, every Afro-American community in America. We must establish all over the country schools of our own to train our children, become scientists and mathematicians. We intend to take the tools of education to help raise our people to an unprecedented level of excellence and self-respect through their own efforts. That's Brother Malcolm on education. Here's Dr. King on education. Education without, with education without social action is a one-sided value because it has no true power or potential. Social action without education is a weak expression of pure energy. These uninformed by educated thought can take false directions. We go into, when we go into action and confront our adversaries, we must be as armed with knowledge as they are. Our policies should have the strength of deep analysis beneath them to be able to challenge the clever sophistry of our opponents. That's not the king, y'all. And when you watch some of stuff going on today, you wish they would listen to these two positions. Because we have a tendency now to think, people think that just getting out there and chanting and, and, and running around and chanting you know, just is, is doing something. What he said, Dr. King said that uh, these uninformed by educated thought can take false directions. When we, go into, when we go into action and confront our adversaries, we must be as all of us knowledge as they are. Now how many times have you watched the demonstrations going to there, you, do you think those people are armed with knowledge? Not very many. But, and you, but those same people will probably tell you how much they love Dr. King. So they're not paying attention to what the brother was saying. Okay. Leadership. Dr. King is rough on black leadership for him. Negro leaders suffer from this, this interplay of solidarity and divisiveness. Being either exalted excessive, being either being either exalted excessively or grossly abused, but some of those leaders who suffer from lack of sustained support are not without weaknesses that give substance to criticism. The most serious is aloofness and absence of faith in their people. The white establishment is skilled in flattering and cultivating emerging leaders. It presses its own image on them, and finally, from from, from imitation of manners, dress, and style of living a deeper strain of, of corruption develops. This kind of Negro leader requires the white man's, con re re acquires the white man's contempt for the ordinary Negro. He is often at like, more at home with the middle class white than he is among his own people. And frequently his physical home is moved up and away from the ghetto. His language changes, his location changes, his, his income changes, and ultimately he changes from the representative of the Negro to the white man and to the white man's representative to the Negro. The tragedy is that too often he does not recognize what he has, what has happened to him. Now I know y'all ain't never heard this Dr. King talking about leadership. Have y'all ever heard this Dr. King? Yes. Some people have? Yes. Good. But I know the majority of us have. The majority of us have. Brother Malcolm on leadership. Our, our accent will be on youth. We need, we need new ideas, new methods, new approaches. We will call upon young students of political science throughout the, the nation to help us. We will encourage uh, these young students to launch their own independent study and give us their analysis and their suggestions. We are completely disgusted with the old adult established politicians. We want to see some new faces, more militant faces. 
That's what Malcolm is talking about, the development. He sees the, develop, the necessity of developing the, uh, young leaders, new leadership. Okay, so, so that is uh, a little bit of what we experienced at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, May 19th on uh, Malcolm X's 93rd birthday. And this is A. Peter Bailey, someone who knew Malcolm and worked with Malcolm in the organization Afro-American Unity. I encourage people to read the article um, entitled Martin Luther King Jr. Met Malcolm X Just Once. The photo still haunts us with what was lost. Martin Luther King Jr. Met Malcolm X Just Once. Uh, the photo still haunts us with what was lost. And this is uh, from uh, the Washington Post, okay, from the Washington Post. And uh, in this article, this is written by Deneen L. Brown. You've heard me talk about it before. But uh, she talks about how uh, uh, Malcolm, uh, in July 31st, 1963, Malcolm sent a letter to uh, the civil rights leaders asking for a meeting with them. And he said that if uh, Nikita Khrushchev could meet with John F. Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy meet with Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev was the uh, leader, leader of Russia at the time. He said if they could put, together, put aside their uh, large differences uh, or great differences, then uh, African-American leaders should be able to put together their minor differences and, uh, and meet, okay? They should be able to put together their minor differences and, uh, and meet. And he said that they needed to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. OK, a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. All right. Um, OK, let's go. Uh, let's see here. So. Now, Malcolm did not uh, he did not get a response from Dr. King. OK, this was one month before the March on Washington. OK, keep in mind, this is one month. So this is July 1963. Malcolm is still in the nation of Islam. The return address uh, on the letter was Muhammad's Mosque, number 7, 113, uh, 113 Lenox Avenue, New York, uh, New York, okay? And um, uh, Malcolm opened the letter, and he said, Dear sir, he called for a united uh, front against racial oppression in the country. So Malcolm was calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders. A lot of people don't know this. So they say, oh, I was with Malcolm, I was with Dr. King. Malcolm, people don't understand, Malcolm, even towards the end of his tenure, in the nation of Islam was calling for a unification of uh, the civil rights leaders. All right. And then we know that uh, he officially leads the nation of Islam, March 8th, 1964, March 26th, 1964. When you see the pictures of Dr. King and Malcolm X, that, that is at the U uh, S Senate debate for the um, that's at the U S Senate debate for the uh, civil rights act of uh, 64. That's at the U S Senate debate for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, okay? All right, uh, let's go to the, uh, let's go back to the phone lines. Let's go to Chad, uh, line two. Hey, Chad, thanks for holding. Welcome to the African History Network Show. Go ahead, uh, tell us where you're calling from. Uh, Detroit. Hello, Mr. Hotel. Okay, how's it going? I just wanted to say, um, you know, that, that latest Marvel movie, uh, you know, the Infinity War, the latest one, how did it do against Black Panther? Did it exceed it or no or equal to it? Uh, I'm not sure how I did, or I have to look at boxofficemojo.com. I'm not sure uh, how I did. I know pre-ticket okay. sales uh, eclipsed uh, Black Panther, but uh, at the box office, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it uh, it may have eclipsed uh, uh, Black Panther at the box office. I haven't been keeping track of it uh, after the first Oh, weekend. okay. Yeah. And also, it, um, I wanted to say that did mention with the Roseanne Barr thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she is a lady, I think it was almost 20 years ago, longer or less, okay. when she didn't even know the national anthem, but yet still she disrespected it in the country. And I heard she made a real obscene gesture right, when did. people started booing her and stuff like that. Now, if that were African-American person mm -hmm. or anybody of any other color, their career would have been over. Yeah. And that just all does is solidifies the still double standard that we have in this country, you know, with... um. You know, and, and my personal take on it, due to these police shootings and things of that nature that have been taken effect and, mm -hmm. and no justice being served in any regard, um, I think race relations have been permanently damaged beyond repair due to that and because of that, mm -hmm. you know, because of no justice. And, um, you know, I, I don't know which way direction this country is going. I don't know if the one number 45 is going to get impeached or not or whatnot. I hear 
that there's talk that they might be reinstating the draft. So it's not going to be nothing good for right. people of color, especially Afro American. You right. know, whatever way this country goes, if it does go that route, you know what I mean? I hope we don't go to war, but I'm just saying there's always something that's not going to benefit us, and, and that's sad. Exactly. But um, that's the hand we've been dealt with, and what's your take on it, sir? Okay. And uh, I'll listen. Okay, and then uh, we're going to go to this clip of Dr. King. Uh, go back to my sister's fan page, the African History Network. Okay, and uh, I just posted a clip of Dr. King there. Okay, so... Uh, was once again, see, politics impacts every aspect of our life, and this is why uh, elections have consequences. Okay, I warned people about Trump before the election. A lot of people didn't want to listen. They thought it was cool to vote for Jill Stein or something like that. And I told people, you, Jill Stein was polling about 2% national polls. If all Af- if all six, So there were 16.4 million African Americans registered to vote in uh, uh, 2016. If all 16, keep scrolling. If all 16.4 million uh, who uh, who were registered to vote voted for uh, Jill Stein, they voted for Jill Stein twice. Right there, Dr. King, pull that up, please. If they all voted for Jill Stein twice, uh, she still would have lost by a landslide, okay? Uh, so we're going to uh, pull up this clip here of Dr. King. We're going to start this at the 16-minute mark. It's about 26 minutes. We're going to start at about the 16-minute mark. So this was a clip of uh, Dr. King. And this was uh, restored by uh, NBC News, okay? So this is from uh, May uh, 8th, uh, I think it's May 8th, 1967, okay? May 8th, 1967. And uh, Dr. King talks about uh, after civil rights and the Black Power Movement, okay? And he says... um, It's a cruel, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his bootstraps. And many Negroes by the thousands and millions have been left bootless as the result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma. Okay, we have it queued up. Okay, okay, let's go, let's let's go to this clip. Economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base uh, overlooked. So I think these things are absolutely necessary. The other thing is that America free uh, overlooked. Because he's he's talking about the economic condition and how the U.S. gave... Uh, white immigrants coming to this country a economic basis, okay, uh, and gave them land. The thing is that America freed the slaves in 19, I mean, 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom... Uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, o- they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. Apart from wanting to live better, which all of us want to do, to raise one's children in a better way, to be better, Does the Negro in America know what he wants to be? I'm convinced that uh, almost every Negro in this country, other than 
those who have been so scarred by the system that they've become pathological in the process, and we all have to battle with pathology. Nobody really knows what it means uh, to be a Negro unless one can really experience it. And I know we all have to battle with this constant drain of uh, a feeling of nobodiness. But in spite of this, uh, I think the vast majority of Negroes in this country know that they want to be people, they want to be men, they want equality, period. It just boils down to that. And we haven't been able to be people, we haven't been men, because of all of the uh, conditions that we've lived with and the syndrome of deprivation surrounding conditions, whether it's in housing, or in the economic area, or in schools, or in the vicious credit practices that we face in the ghetto, and all of the problems of closed doors and constant defeats. But uh, in spite of all this, I think we all know, uh, basically, that we want to be men. We want to be persons judged not on the basis of the color of our skin, but on the basis of the content of our character. But you know that many young Negroes don't want anything that smacks of the American white middle class. But do they want something that smacks of whatever is the black middle class? Or do they just not want bourgeois values, which after all are the basis of this democracy? Well, I think uh, we have to see what they are saying. I would be the first to agree that uh, integration does not mean giving up everything that has an Afro-American taint, so to speak, a background. I think there are certain unique things within any culture and certain cultural patterns that when you get to the process of amalgamation, can really lift the whole culture. And it seems to me that integration at its best is the opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. I think the other thing that we've got to see is that these young people are saying that there must be a revolution of values in our country. As Jimmy Baldwin said on one occasion, what advantage is there in being integrated into a burning house? And I feel that uh, there is a need for a revolution of values in America because some of the values that presently exist are certainly out of line with the uh, values and the idealistic structure uh, that brought our nation into being. Unfortunately, we haven't been true to these ideals. And many of the values of uh, so-called white middle-class society are values uh, that need to be reviewed and uh, re-evaluated, and in a real sense, they need to be changed. So I think the young people in the Negro community who are raising these questions are raising some very profound questions about our total society. In other words, they are saying that there must be a restructuring of the architecture uh, of our society where values are concerned. And with this, I would agree with. So in the quest for integration, I think we can offer our whole nation something because there are three evils in our nation. It's not only racism, but economic exploitation of poverty would be one, and then militarism. And I think in a sense, and in a very real sense, these three are tied inextricably together, and we aren't going to get rid of one without getting rid of the other. When you stood on the Lincoln Memorial <laughs> that day in August, 63, and you said, I had a dream, did that dream envision that you could see a war in Asia <coughs> preventing the federal government doing for the Negroes, preventing the society doing for the Negroes, that which you think had to be done? No, I didn't envision that then. I must confess that that period was a great period of hope for me and uh, I'm sure for many others all across the nation, many of, of the Negroes who had about lost hope, saw a solid decade of progress in the South. And uh, in 1954, which was, uh, I mean, 64, 1963, nine years after the Supreme Court's decision to be in the March on Washington, 
meant a great deal. It was a high moment, a great watershed moment. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. That dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments, and I've come to see that uh, we have uh, many more difficult days ahead, and some of the old optimism was a little superficial, and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go and that we are involved in a war on Asian soil, uh, which, if not checked and stopped, can poison the very soul of our nation. Dr. <clears throat> King, even if there had not been a war in Asia, would you still not have had this nightmare insofar as the Negro movement for equality then touched on two things that the white community holds sacred, <clears throat> their children and their property? Oh, I have no doubt that we would have encountered great difficulties, great problems of resistance if the war had not uh, been in existence, so that I'm not going to say that all of our problems would be solved if the war in Vietnam is ended, but I do say that the war makes it infinitely more difficult to deal with these problems. Uh, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, uh, it loses its social perspective and programs of social uplift suffer. This is just a, a fact of history, so that we do face many more difficulties uh, as a result of the war. It's much more difficult to really arouse a conscience during a time of war. I noticed the other day, some weeks ago, a Negro was shot down. Okay, so that is, uh, that's from NBC News. Uh, check this out at NBCNews.com. Martin Luther King Jr. speaks with NBC News 11 months before assassination. Martin Luther King Jr. speaks with NBC News 11 months before assassination. That was from May of 1967. I think it was May 8th or May 9th, right? And we know that Dr. King met with uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad a few months before he was assassinated. So he did meet with Malcolm X when Malcolm sent the invitation July 31st, 1963. If Malcolm has still been alive in 67 or 68, Malcolm, uh, Dr. King would definitely have met with the Malcolm X, okay? Uh, and we know that uh, Dr. King also talked about uh, at the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land through an act of Congress, um, uh, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they, they built land-grant colleges uh, with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they built county agents. Uh, they provided county agents. Okay, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they uh, could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. This is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this uh, campaign, we're coming to get our check. And this was the poor people's campaign. So he said this in 1968, uh, shortly before he was assassinated. Check that out on page 74 of the third edition of How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy. Hey, look, I got to get, get a guy. I have to get out of here. We have to make way for Pastor Mo. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the African History Network show. We're here Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, right here on 910 a.m. Super Station Future Radio. Visit our website, African History Network, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Remember, right knowledge corrects wrong behaviors, not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. <laughs>